Well, good morning. Good morning. My name is Kayla. I'm one of the pastors here at Northgate, and I'm so, so glad that you're here. Here at Northgate, we envision transforming our homes, communities, and world by pursuing God, building community, and unleashing compassion. And I hope that just by you being here today, you will catch some of that vision and choose to join us. Um, along along this journey that God is taking us on. We are actually in the second week of a series called Bold. Can you say bold this morning? Bold. All right, good. I just wanted to see if you're still awake. Perfect. We're spending some time in the book of Acts, and we are looking to see what the what God did through this early church. Now, the book of Acts is in the New Testament, which is the second half of the Bible. It comes right after the Gospels, which are the stories of Jesus. So there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the very next book is Acts. So if you want to turn to that today, if you have your Bible with you, you're welcome to turn there. And if you don't, don't worry, we'll have it up on the screen for you. We're looking to find how God worked in this brand new baby church and to see how God started to do bold things through his bold followers. We're going to have a conversation about real life, Jesus-directed, Holy Spirit-empowered boldness, the kind that will spark revival and transformation in those homes, communities, and world that we envision changing. So last week, we learned through the book of Acts that boldness is behavior born out of belief. Boldness is behavior born out of belief. So just like our people in process series, we're learning that this is an inside out transformation. This is an inside out process. Boldness is behavior born out of belief. And we watched the apostle Peter right after Jesus had been crucified, resurrected and ascended to heaven. We saw that God gives ordinary people extraordinary boldness that will amaze the world. God gives ordinary people, people like you and me. In fact, last week we saw that the Greek word is actually idiots, right? <laughs> he gives very ordinary people extraordinary boldness. And when he does that, the world takes notice and people are amazed by that boldness. And finally then, I challenged you to take a step into this boldness cycle. We looked at this cycle that goes um, by spending time with Jesus then you have faith in Jesus, which as it grows leads to boldness, and then boldness leads to results, which again leads you to spend more time with Jesus, and it keeps going and going and going. But we also saw how that cycle can work backwards. That if you don't spend time with Jesus, you're not going to have that faith. And if you don't have that faith, you're not going to have the boldness. And if you don't have the boldness, you're not going to see the results. But you can stop and step into that boldness cycle um, so that we can see those amazing results that God wants to give us. But we stated very, very succinctly that boldness is not actually the goal, that knowing Jesus is the goal. We've all seen plenty of people who are bold for things other than Jesus, and that's kind of a mess. Boldness isn't the goal, but knowing Jesus is the goal, and boldness is always a byproduct of knowing Jesus. The more you know Jesus, the more you will be bold for Jesus. Well, so today we're going to be in the uh, book of Acts chapter 4. So if you want to turn there, you are welcome to do that now. I want to talk to you today about prayer. We're going to talk about praying really, really bold prayers. Because if boldness is a byproduct of knowing Jesus, then prayer is an integral part of both. Because we know that prayer is a communication with God. That's simply what it is. It's a church word for communicating with God, talking to and listening to God. And so to know Jesus, there needs to be communication with him. And boldness comes alongside knowing Jesus. So prayer, communication with God, is also an integral part of boldness. I spent a lot of my time as a pastor helping people learn to pray. I was at a church in Texas for five years, and one of my jobs there was to run the online church ministry. We had about 2,000 people every weekend uh, log in online and go to church online. My pastor called it pajama church. <laughs> um, but we had people that would connect with us from all over the country and sometimes all over the world. And I had volunteers because we didn't want it to just be Netflix for church. I had volunteers that were there with me, and they would be in chat rooms with the people. And we opened every conversation like this. We would say, welcome, black cat hat. 
how can I pray for you today? And that's how we started every conversation. We would, we would private chat them and say, hello, we're so glad you're here. How can I pray for you today? And so it was pretty bold to do that because we had no idea if these people wanted to talk to us at all. But you would be amazed. You would be amazed at what people were willing to tell us to pray for them. You know, that same digital courage that makes Facebook so nasty also really helped me out in online ministry because <laughs> people got brave and would ask. I had a few volunteers, though, and one of them came in. She was, she was kind of a quiet, uh, meek woman. She loved Jesus very much. She grew up actually in the Catholic Church and uh, came to know Jesus in a very real way and really started living for him. And one of the ways that she wanted to do that was to learn to serve. And she thought online ministry would be perfect because she'd go sit in a room and use her fingers. And I was like, perfect. So she sat with me and the first day that she came in, I explained to her what we were going to do. We were going to be praying with people. We would ask them what they wanted prayer for and we would pray with them only with their fingers. And she looked at me kind of like I had seven heads, but she said, okay, that's fine. And then came back the next week, but she came back with a folder. It was a folder this thick, and it had page after page after page in it. And I, I didn't know her. And I said, what, what's that? And she goes, they're my prayers. I've done research. <laughs> she, had, she had Googled and come up with prayers for every possible thing someone could ask for prayer for. <laughs> Because she was so nervous that she wouldn't know what to pray. And so I, I stifled my giggle because I thought, that's a lot. Of, <laughs> that's a lot. And, and over the weeks, she started using that less and less. As she started praying bolder and bolder and bolder prayers for people. And by three years later, she was actually one of my boldest prayers in this sweet little quiet, meek body. <laughs> she was very, very bold. So I've spent a lot of time, I had some friends that really didn't want to pray out loud. Anybody, when they first started praying, feel real nervous whenever they had to pray out loud in front of a group? No, you're all very great. Okay, fine. Well, I know some people that were really nervous about praying out loud. In fact, part of the rooted experience is you do a prayer experience. And part of that is to pray out loud eventually. And I had to make a deal with some of my rooted people. Okay, you only have to say one word during this whole three hours. I just need you to say one word. Challenge yourself to say one word. Um, and then I had another friend that every time we went out to lunch, she told me she was really struggling to pray out loud. It made her really nervous. And I said, well, you don't have to be nervous around me. Like, it's just you and me. So every time we go out to lunch, you have to say the prayer before lunch. She did not want to go out to lunch with me. It was so sad. <laughs> but she actually got better and better at it because that's, that's part of it. So if you're here today and prayer is something that is not a normal part of your life or you're really uncomfortable with it, this message is for you. And if you're here today and you are what we might call a prayer warrior, somebody that prays constantly every day, not just for their meals and at bedtime, then this message I pray is for you because I will tell you I was deeply convicted this week. As I got ready for this message, I was deeply, deeply convicted. And the first thing that caught me was this. What you pray for reflects what you believe about God. What you pray for reflects what you believe about God, which that also means that what you don't pray for reflects what you believe about God. If you don't pray at all, you don't believe in God, or maybe you don't believe he answers prayers. If you have small prayers, maybe you don't really believe that God is a God who answers big prayers. If almost all your prayers are for yourself, bless me, help me, comfort me, be with me, you might believe that God is there to serve you. And what happens when God doesn't do what you want? That you get offended that God must not be real? And what about the times that we think of prayer as a last resort? You know, I've tried everything else. I've exhausted myself doing this on my own, so I guess all that's left is to pray. Have you ever wondered what God's thoughts are whenever we say that? Like, well, I guess all we have left to do is pray. And he's like, oh, okay. Well, it's really too bad you're down to the bottom of the barrel to talk to the creator of the universe. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. What you pray for reflects what you believe about God. So what did you pray for last week? What did you pray for last week? 
And if God answered yes to all the prayers you prayed last week, what would change about the world? If he said yes to every single one of your prayers, what would the world look like today? Would marriages be healed? Would orphans be brought into families? Would hungry people be filled? Would churches be busting at the seams? What would be different about the world today if God answered yes to all your prayers last week? If you pray like most people in our culture, the only things in the world that would be different would be the things that are very close to you, the things that you can reach out and touch. But if you really want to make a difference, if you really want to see God do things in this life, you're going to need to learn to pray some very bold prayers. And I'll be honest, this message today is a rally cry for our church. Because if we want to see God do something through us, we're going to have to learn to pray some really, really bold prayers together, together us here. So let's take a look at the book of Acts. Let me give you some context in case you missed last week. We're looking at Peter and John and their encounter with Christ in living a bold life in the New Testament. If you remember, Peter preached boldly. And in that bold sermon, he told them that really they were the ones that crucified Jesus and that they needed to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And 3,000 people were born into the family of God that day. Then they walked by a lame man outside the temple, and he, he asked for money, and instead they said, pick up your mat and walk. And all of a sudden, the guy got up, and he walked, walking and leaping and praising God. Then the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish rulers of the day, they arrested Peter and John for preaching in the name of Jesus, and they put them on a very short trial at which they asked him, by what name and what authority are you doing these things? So Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ, the man that you crucified, but who God raised from the dead. Peter all of a sudden got very bold, and he was starting to see pretty amazing results. This was full-on, full-blown bold. Religious leaders would have loved to keep Peter and John in prison or killed them or beat them, but because the world was amazed about the boldness of Peter and that this man who had been unable to walk for 40 years was now walking and leaping and praising God, they knew they couldn't keep Peter and John in prison. So they had to release them, and that's actually where we pick up today. In Acts chapter 4, verse 23, here's what scripture says. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people, which is their fellow Christ followers. And they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. We don't know exactly what that was, but we can assume it was they threatened us. Don't ever speak in the name of Jesus again. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. That was their reaction. Peter and John said, these guys threw us in jail, and then they threatened to beat us and told us, okay, we're releasing you, but don't you dare say the name of Jesus ever again. And that body, that family of believers, their first reaction was to raise their voices together in prayer to God. How often is that your reaction when you hear scary things? I wish it was faster in my reaction. There's something incredibly powerful when believers come together and lift up things in prayer to God. There's something unbelievably powerful. We see it all throughout scripture. And in fact, I mentioned Rooted before. One of the experiences you do in Rooted is you spend time in prayer together. You have a prayer experience. And when I would introduce this idea to our Rooted participants, I would say, and I, I've done it at a few different churches, I would say, and you'll get to do a three-hour prayer experience can I tell you what the room sounded like? Like this. <gasps> and you can see it all over their faces. You can see like, lady, I forgot to pray for my lunch. I cannot be praying for three hours. Are you serious? I'm going to fall asleep. This is going to be horrible. And spoiler alert, every single time after the prayer experience, people went, wait, is that up? Are we done? Only three hours? And I'm like, huh, funny story. Right before this, you were super nervous. But there's something powerful when we get together and we pray together. And we see it through scripture, specifically in the book of Acts, over and over and over. We see what happens when people pray together. So maybe that's not your natural nature. 
Maybe you're not like, oh man, I really hope they have a prayer meeting today. Really hope this one lasts five hours. Sign me up. <laughs> Maybe that's not your natural state, and I get that. I do. But I truly believe that something incredible will happen when we pray with each other. You may not have a lot of faith for something, but whenever you show up to pray with other people, if they have faith for that, it's almost like we get to stand on their shoulders, borrowing their faith, and then it exponentially grows the faith of the group. There's something powerful about praying together. When you read scripture, there's power when believers come in agreement before God, and that's what was happening here. Under extraordinary persecution, they came, and we get to read what their prayer was to God. Verse 24, the middle of the verse, they said this, Sovereign Lord, now let's stop there, because we need to understand that first word, sovereign. Sovereign means supreme and ultimate power. God has supreme and ultimate power. So their first words out of their mouth in their prayer is, God, you are supremely powerful. You are ultimately powerful. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They were putting themselves in a posture of God consciousness. They're saying, you're in charge. You're the sovereign Lord. Now, do you think God needed to be reminded of that? No, he knew. So why would they say it except to posture their own selves? We sing like we do, not because God needs to be reminded of how faithful he is. We say those things to remind ourselves how faithful he is. Amen. And it's really important to remember how sovereign God is and how powerful he is and how faithful he is when you're going to start praying the things that they started praying. Because we'll need to be reminded of that. Because they prayed to two very bold things in this prayer. Verse 29, they said this. Now, Lord, consider their threats. We already talked about what those threats would be. Being beaten, put in prison, or killing them. That's likely what they're talking about here. Consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They prayed for more boldness. Isn't boldness what got them thrown in jail to begin with? And here they are, just barely being released from prison, and they're like, all right, first thing, God, I need you to make me bold. I can imagine that people, their mothers in the room going, hold it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, our culture today would say, maybe lay off the praying for boldness thing a little bit. I think you actually jumped the shark already. Boldness is what got you into this mess. And if you get thrown in prison again, how can the word go out? Plus, you have season tickets for football, and the 49ers are actually good. <laughs> we don't want to mess anything up with that. I want you to take just a note that that was a very good sports ball reference on my part. And I'm going to need a point for that later. Thank you very much. That's sad that that's what got the biggest claps today. It's all right. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But have you ever prayed for boldness? Why wouldn't you pray for boldness? Why are the reasons, because I, I certainly forget to pray for boldness, and there are times where I think about it and still don't. And here are some just quick thoughts on why people don't pray for boldness. Because you haven't thought of it? Um, because it's kind of scary? Because you like your comfortable life and you're afraid God might answer yes to boldness? Praying boldness is an others-centered prayer. It's not turned inward. Nobody's going to pray for boldness for themselves. You're praying for boldness in a look outward. Praying for boldness is an others-centered prayer. Boldness typically doesn't help me. Boldness is for the benefit of someone else, for the world, to help them know the love of God through Jesus Christ. Most of our prayers we pray happen to be really self-centered. Help me. Be with me. And these are not bad prayers. I'm just, I'm just calling us to something bigger. I'm calling us to something deeper. In college, I remember one morning praying, God, open my eyes to see the opportunities that you give me to be your hands and feet. I got super convicted. God, I want to see what it is that you want from me. And I remember praying it. It was really early in the morning, which was a miracle in and of itself. 
I was a college student. Mm -hmm. And I remember praying and going, okay, I'm ready. Like, I'm ready. You just show me. And there was somewhere in my mind that I thought, so this is going to be a normal day. I opened my door, to, like to my room. I opened the door and there was a girl sitting across the hall in the middle of the hallway at 6 a.m. bawling her eyes out. And I was like, oh, that was fast. <laughs> All right, here we go. I mean, you couldn't walk by that morning. There's no way I could walk by that morning. So I stopped and talked to her and we prayed together and helped her. We went and had breakfast together. And then I walked through my day with those kinds of glasses on. The kinds that I really believed God was going to do what I asked him to do. And it was amazing what happened that day. I think that God can do the same thing for us too. And I'll be honest, sometimes when you pray for boldness, you're going to find yourself doing crazy stuff. There was one time I asked God to, to show me where I needed to humble myself. That's a horrible prayer. <laughs> it's like praying for patience. You are bound to get stuck in the elevator that day. I remember, I, God, please show me where I need to humble myself. And there was this woman um, that, that was hard to love at school. And uh, she was in administration, and I promise she touched everything I did. And she just, she just made everything I did very, very hard. And frankly, I'll be really honest with you, nobody liked her. She was just kind of mean. Crotchety is the right word that we might use. Don't worry, I'll humble myself here in just a minute. <laughs> and I remember in my quiet time reading through scripture, and then all of a sudden I heard God say, man, you got to wash her feet. And I thought, what? <laughs> but that's weird. And I don't know her. And all I kept hearing was wash her feet, wash her feet. So I checked it with my roommate. <laughs> I was like, Anna, who she also didn't like her. I was like, I think I need to go wash this woman's feet. And Anna was like, good for you. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. I really, really feel convicted about this. And because she's a good best friend, she said, all right, I'm coming with you, but I'm not happy about it. So she came with me, and we had another friend that came with me, and I brought this basin of water to the office. And this precious woman is of the age that she wore pantyhose all the time. Um. So I got down and I looked at her and I said, I, I need to humble myself. I need to apologize to you for the way that I treated you. And she was like, I didn't know you treated me bad. I'm like, right. <laughs> but I did in my head. And I need, you are leadership in my life and I need to honor you. And I, I would really like to wash your feet. God told me you needed to wash your feet. And she was like, okay. <laughs> and so I knelt down and that's when I saw the pantyhose. And I thought, well, <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do. And I looked at her and she was like, <laughs> so I washed her feet with pantyhose on. <laughs> and you know, a month ago, now that was decades ago, actually at this point. And a month ago, one of my friends said, do you remember that time you were nuts and we had to go wash that lady's feet? <laughs> so when you pray for boldness, all I'm saying is be ready to do some crazy things. And people might think you're crazy, but I also know that by the end of the time that we were washing that woman's feet, there was not a dry eye in that office. God's spirit was thick in that place because we were being boldly obedient to what he was asking us. Even though it was a little bit crazy. So when you pray, use me, use me for your glory, make me bold, stir me up, give me eyes to see the needs for those that, I, that you want me to work with. Give me a heart sensitive to those who are hurting. Give me a prompting of the spirit to minister to those who need you, even strangers. You pray and you watch as God will do something in your life and in your eyes and in your mind and in your heart that will stir you to boldness for his glory. Pray those things and see what he does. The second thing he prayed for, first he prayed for boldness and then he prayed for miracles. It says, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They pray for boldness. And then verse 30, it says this, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And then here's what happened. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Stretch out your hand to heal, 
to perform miraculous signs and wonders. They're praying big, bold prayers. They're praying for miracles, heal sick people, raise the dead, help us cast out demons, do miraculous signs, God. If you want to make a big and bold difference in this world, you pray big, bold prayers. If we want our church to do big, bold things for the kingdom, if we want to see his kingdom come through us here on this corner, on the corner of Valencia and 24th, then we will pray big, bold prayers here. Because what you pray for reflects what you believe in God about. Do you believe that he will still do those things? Do we believe that God is the one of the Old Testament, God is the God of the New Testament, and God happens to be the God of 2019? Yes, we believe that. And so we have to pray in that way too. You pray small prayers, you're believing in a small God. But here we're going to pray big prayers because we believe in a big God. You know, there are so many that pray, thank you for this day. When I was little, I would pray, thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for Mommy, Daddy, Holly, Heidi, and Kayla. I, I tagged myself on the end of that. And then I would pray for food if we were sitting at the dinner table, and I'd pray for good sleep if it was at night. And those are good prayers. They also are prayers of a nine-year-old. They're small prayers. Pray for Aunt Sally's cat to come back. Pray for Uncle Tom's bunion who's really bothering him. Praying for those small things are not bad because God cares about the sparrow, so certainly he cares about that. But sometimes I wonder if God is just begging us to pray for something big. If he isn't saying, guys, give me something good. Pray for something that can only be done if I move my hand. Pray for something that can only be explained as my hand moving and working in your life. Pray for that. But what if it doesn't happen? What if, it, what if he says no? Is that why we don't pray those? That's why I don't pray those. There are things in my life that I'm afraid to pray for. Because I'm afraid that if God says no, that my faith can't take it. So are there things in your life that you want to pray for, but there's not a whole lot of wiggle room for God? <laughs> Have you prayed those? Have you heard people pray, God, I want you to heal him, and I want you to heal him now, and you're like, ooh, okay. Not a lot of wiggle room here, God. I see people in the scriptures pray those all the time. I see people in scripture praying that the sun would stand still. Not a whole lot of wiggle room there. But you know, sometimes we pray that the sun will stand still and then it comes up the next morning. Sometimes we pray for these big prayers and God doesn't answer them the way that we think. That he doesn't answer them the way that we even ask him to. And maybe it seems he doesn't answer them at all. And we don't want to be disappointed with God. We don't want to make God look bad. And maybe we don't want to make ourselves look bad. Because if we prayed that out loud in front of other people and God didn't show up, what does that say about me? We give God escape clauses. But I want to live with no fear. I want to... I want to live a life asking God for anything because I have seen him do things that are completely unexplainable. Amen. It won't always mean that God does exactly what I ask for. But I want my faith to be big enough that I could ask God for something and still be big enough to handle when God says no. Because if I believe that God is sovereign God, then my faith can be big enough to ask for the big stuff and him say no. So as a church, I want us to pray big things. I want us to pray big, bold prayers. And I want our faith to be big enough to handle God saying no because he is sovereign. He is ultimately powerful and he is in charge. I'm actually going to ask you to pray some bold prayers with me this morning because here's the thing. We actually need God to do something in our church. Amen. We need him to do some big things in our church. There's a legacy of faith here. One that dates back almost 100 years. 
It's a legacy that decided to hear God's call to stay in this city on this corner, even through some really painful and hard seasons. It's a legacy that believed God wanted to do something greater here, so they built a second floor. We're now a week away from going back up to that second floor. We're one week away. Next week, we're not down here. We're upstairs. And we're praying, believing that God is going to do something big that we would need to move up there. We're a month away from the beginning of the Christmas season here at Northgate. And to kick off that Christmas season on December 6th, we're going to put on our very first big event over the decades. But if my research in history is correct, this one is going to be um, one of the biggest invitations, certainly. It's interesting, when I came to visit, actually before I moved here, just was coming to visit this place, I remember standing out on the patio and thinking, you know what this patio needs? A really big Christmas tree. <laughs> and wouldn't it be cool if the Christmas tree was so big that we invited the whole neighborhood to come and be a part of a Christmas tree lighting? Yeah. Wouldn't that be amazing? So no lie, a couple of weeks later, I was standing on the patio with one of you, actually. And I was sitting out here, and, <laughs> and out of the blue, somebody said, you know, we used to have a Christmas tree on the patio, and we had a Christmas tree lighting. And I was like, Really? And I said, that's interesting. That, that's kind of my dream for that, too. And they're like, oh, yeah, we used to do it. I said, that's so interesting. And then I was talking to Megan, one of our staff people, and I was, I was trying to, um, well, I was trying to get her on board. And I was like, Megan, what if we had the first Mission District Christmas tree lighting and we invited the whole neighborhood to come? And she was like, oh, that's amazing. And I don't know if you know Megan at all. Some of you have had the chance to meet her. She comes over here once in a while, and she, her eyes just got big. And, of course, she was decorating the whole place before we got done. And I thought, now how are we going to convince Larry? Larry's our senior pastor at Northgate. And I was like, all right, we're going to have to wait till he's in a good mood. We'll go buy him lunch. And then I'll be like, so I want to buy a big Christmas tree. But I didn't have to. I was in a meeting with Larry about a week later, and Larry said, okay, I have this crazy idea. <laughs> and I was like, okay, what is it? Knowing that maybe I could follow up my crazy idea with his. And he was like, I want to buy a 35-foot Christmas tree and put it on the patio. <laughs> and I was like, that's an amazing idea. <laughs> this is so amazing. And so I know it's silly because it's just a Christmas tree, but I really believe God is calling us to a Christmas tree lighting on our patio. Because there are coincidences and then there's that. And so we are. We're inviting about 109,000 households to come and enjoy our first annual Mission District Christmas tree lighting. And you'll start seeing on the back of city buses Christmas at Northgate. And we're going to show up, all of us, with hot chocolate and maybe some cookies and we're going to invite the community to come and celebrate with us the beginning of Christmas season. And then we're praying bold, big, huge prayers that they would come back and hear the gospel at one of our Christmas Eve services. Yeah. And not just hear the gospel, we're, we're praying that there will be people that will accept Christ as their Lord and Savior at Christmas and then step into the process of discipleship here at this church on this corner. And we really do believe that God is going to do that. And so we really have to pray really big, bold prayers for that to happen, because I'll be really honest, that's crazy talk is what it is. It's crazy talk, unless we just happen to have the creator of the universe, the most powerful, sovereign God standing behind us, Amen. that we know with a flip of his wrist, he could make that tree 60 foot tall. We're not praying for that. <laughs> <laughs> 35 foot is tall enough. <laughs> So we're going to pray that today, and in fact, we're going, to, we're going to spend some time together praying. So if you wouldn't mind getting yourself into a posture of prayer, whether you want to stand or kneel, whether you want to sit right where you are and put your hands up or out, or however you want to pray, we're going to start praying. And I'm going to, I'm going to lead us first, 
And then John is going to start playing a song. We're going to stand and we're going to worship together. We're going to pray to the God of this city. Because we know who that is, even if they don't. So we pray with me, God, we believe that you are king of all kings. We believe that you are Lord of lords. We believe that you are the all-powerful sovereign God. And so, Father, right now, we are throwing off any small fear that we might have in us that you won't show up. And we are praying that, God, you will do big, amazing things. God, we pray specifically that you would bring thousands of people to hear and celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus. God, we pray that you would rise up an army of prayers. That you would bring people that want nothing more than to see your face. And, Father, that you would bring people that have no idea who you are and that will hear your name for the very first time. God, we pray that there are people that are serving other gods and other masters, that you will bring them to this place and they will hear about the one true master. God, we believe that you are good. We believe that you are powerful. We believe that you are loving and we believe that even if we are undignified in the kind of prayers that we pray, that you will stand in our undignified nature with us. God, so we pray without any pride. We know that you will get all the glory. We promise, Father, that if you show off, Father, if people show up, you will be glorified and made famous, God. We pray big enough prayers that there is no way that these things can be explained outside of your hand moving and working in this place, God. You are good and you are mighty and we pray these things, Father. And now, Father, we pray as a group, God, I ask, that this group of people lift up their voices. If you feel so led, pray out right now what you want God to do, what you're willing to pray for God to do. God, we spend this next minute or so praying these things on our own, but as a family of God here in this place, God, we pray these things. And then, Father, we will follow this prayer with more prayer of worship of the God of this city. You can have a seat. Just another minute. I'm going to close up here. I'm going to give you some specific ways that you can join. I'm asking our entire church to spend five minutes, just five minutes every day in prayer for what we believe God is doing and what we believe he will do on December 6th and beyond in this Christmas season. In fact, I want to help remind you because I know life is busy. So I actually do suggest you just set an alarm on your phone for every day. Pick a time where you know you can spend five minutes, just five minutes in prayer for this church and the people that will come. And and I want to help you. And so I'm going to send out an email every day in these next 32 some days that will give us all something very specifically to pray for every day. So if you want to if you want to commit to doing that, I'm going to ask we're just going to use our connection cards today. So you can just put your name and your email on this on this card that you got when you walked in today. We also have some on the back tables if you didn't get one. And then on the back here where it says prayer requests, I just want you to write in big letters Christmas. And I'll know that's our secret code that I need to put you on the email list to send you something to pray every day. Okay? And we will pray every day, you and I, and you and you and you and you. We'll pray every day that God will do some big things here. So if you want to commit to that, if you would be willing to commit to that, just put your name and your email address right here. And then on the back, just write Christmas. And we'll make sure to get you those emails every single day. And then I'm going to ask for another thing very specifically. And I know this might sound crazy, but you know we're already undignified. Let's just dive all the way in. So I'm actually asking that for the next 32 days, that there would be 32 different people that would come right here to our corner and walk around our block. That they would just walk around our building, down, down Valencia, cut 25th, up Orange Alley and then back around just one time that you would come and and you would pray that walk. We're going to pray circles around this place and ask that God do something. Now, listen, there's nothing magic about your feet. There's nothing magic about you praying circles around. And yes, the prayers that you pray in your living room, they're the same, but there is something humbling about coming to this place and praying along the sidewalk and the streets that people will walk to get here. And so if you would be one of those 32 people, I have a little calendar right up here. 
And if you would just write your name down on one of these dates, starting tomorrow the 4th all the way to December 6th, if you would come and write your name on there as you'll be one of the people that day that will come and pray along this little pathway around our church. I'll, I'll also remind you of that. And by I, I mean Alejandra will because she's smarter than all of us. <laughs> so we'll have her do that for you as well. So those are two next steps that you can take. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, wow, you people are crazy. Why would you pray these kinds of things? I don't even know if this whole Jesus thing is for real, but evidently you all believe it. If that's you and you, you want to take a step into this journey, Maybe you're feeling a tugging on your heart like, man, they sound crazy, but I kind of want to be crazy with them. <laughs> then we invite you to go over to the info table. We have a book right here called This Changes Everything. And it's just 21 days that will get you started on your journey with God. Every week we say there's nothing so broken that God cannot mend it. There's nothing so lost that he cannot find it. And there's nothing so dead that God cannot resurrect it. We really believe that. And we believe it because this really does change everything. So we'd love that. We'd love for, uh, to give you that gift today. Will you stand with me as we close today? You know, there's lots of ways you can, you can take a next step today. You can pray with us. You can come walk and pray with us. And we also have a serve day coming up on November 24th, which is during our church service right here. So we're going to meet together. We're going to worship together. We're going to do a short Devo. And then we're going to spend the rest of that morning actually getting our place ready and getting ourselves ready for Christmas. Just that very next weekend. And then we're going to end the day with a mission cafe that will benefit the children of strength. This will be in place of our Thanksgiving offering this week. So if you're waiting to hear about that, that's when we're going to do it is that November 24th Sunday. So make sure to make plans to be a part of that. And you'll hear more about children of strength this month as we get closer to that time. If you are a guest with us today, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for coming to church with me today. Um, we'd love for you to give us a couple weeks. Get to know us. Let us get to know you. We have a special gift for you over there at the tables. We'd love to meet you and learn your name. And thank you for your generosity. It's because you give that God can do some amazing work here on this campus, in this city. And frankly, your generosity reaches all over the world. So thank you for being a part of that. And now we're just going to end like we do every week with a blessing. So you should put your hands out like this in a posture of receiving. May you pray with boldness this week. May you pray big, bold prayers that God himself can answer and no one else. May you live with your eyes wide open to see the opportunities that he's putting right in your path. And may we be a church that looks a little ridiculous because of the kinds of prayers we pray and the kinds of prayers that God will answer. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. And I just want to write my email address for receiving the everyday prayer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, it's you. It's, wow. Put your name, your address, and Christmas. Wow, thank you, thank you. Mm, I will write uh, in this table. Oh, okay, I will write here, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs>